Well, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. It's wonderful uh, to know that uh, so many people have been able to attend this afternoon, and you're all very welcome to our annual meeting for 2021. Uh, we do so hope that this will be the very last one that will be entirely virtual. It's a great chance for our marvellous team to set out their stall and to report on their progress over the last year. But it will be lovely to be able to do this in person. I think there's something like 60 to 80 people out there still joining us as I speak. Uh, and uh, I only wish we were able to, to meet you personally. Uh, as always on these occasions, there's bound to be a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, some of it's very familiar to you all because we've been Zooming so much, but do participate as far as circumstances permit. And if there's any aspect of our work that you would like to talk to us about that isn't covered in this meeting, uh, do contact us uh, later. I, I want to encourage you to um, comment throughout the session uh, via the, the chat box. Uh, just make sure, can you please, to send any uh, questions or any comments you have to all panelists and attendees so that everyone can see and share your thoughts. Also, could you be putting any questions uh, in the chat box as they come to you? There's no need to wait until the question and answer session. Uh, indeed, I, I, I hear that we've already had a few questions submitted already, so uh, don't be shy. We'll try to answer as many as we can, perhaps via email uh, after the event if there are any time constraints. Uh, finally, I should tell you we are recording the webinar and it will be available for you to watch on our YouTube channel in a few days time. So do tell your chums. Now, uh, those of us, uh, and there's not a few of us who are above the age of 50 and perhaps some who are younger, uh, may be familiar with the collection of marvelous essays by the economist F.R. Schumacher, Small is Beautiful, published in 1973. Its subtitle was a study of economics as if people mattered, and it promoted small-scale small technologies uh, and locally-based policies as a superior alternative to the principle that big is better. It's been ranked as one of the most influential books of the 20th century. Although primarily a, a, an economic study, um, and with an environmental message at its core, it's had a huge influence on social sciences and in other areas. And this is where the Sussex Community Foundation and tonight's meeting comes in. Because we concentrate, as many of you know, on giving grants uh, to local charities and community projects, often very small ones. It's not just a matter of faith, but it's one of knowledge. We know that small scale local projects can have the best results in improving people's lives where it matters. That's what we aim to do in Sussex. And at the same time, ensuring uh, that the work that we do and the projects that we support do no harm and indeed may protect our planet. The core of our ethos is to act local for small is beautiful. And now more than ever, also, we must think global because as we all know, we have no alternative. Now, those are by way of introduction. I get to now hand you over to Kevin Richmond, our hardworking, industrious chief executive, who is not going to be playing the piano for you as may be indicated on, on uh, his camera, but he's going to go through this afternoon's agenda uh, and to give us his review of this extraordinary year. Kevin, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Keith. And uh, I'm glad to say that probably, uh, yeah, although you may get bored of me going on, you'd rather me talk than play the piano, I can guarantee. Um, but welcome, everyone, and thank you very much uh, for coming and joining us today uh, for this our annual meeting and the third of our Sussex Uncovered webinars. Uh, our first two webinars have been a, a great success. We've had a lot of engagement from a whole range of people locally. So, we're looking forward to another really interesting uh, session. 
We've talked in previous ones about supporting people with mental and physical health. We've talked about advice and support. Um, and both of those, those web, webinars are available uh, on our YouTube channel or on our website if you've missed them. I'm going to briefly talk through uh, the webinar today and what's going to happen. So first of all, I'm going to give you a brief overview of the year. Uh, we're talking about the year, financial year 21, uh, 2020 to 21, uh, but a bit about what's happened since then as well. Stephen Chamberlain, our head of philanthropy, will then introduce the Sussex Uncovered webinar. And we have two speakers uh, who are talking about their, their work, um, looking at addressing environmental issues, but also helping local people. Um, and I think you'll find those really inspiring. Following that, there's going to be a short question and answer session with the speakers uh, and with the Community Foundation, so to talk about the issues that are arising. I'll give a brief um, roundup and then Keith will close the session. So that gives you an idea what, what to expect, and I hope you will enjoy the, the webinar. So first of all, let me give you a quick overview of the, the financial year 2020 to 21. So of course, like everybody else, our year was dominated by the coronavirus pandemic. And like many other charities, many businesses and all of us, we had to change the way we worked overnight on the 20th of March. We knew at that point this was going to have a massive impact on the community, so we launched right away the Sussex Crisis Fund. We wanted to raise money quickly and get money out quickly to help whatever charities were going to be doing uh, to address the lockdown challenges and, and the pandemic. We didn't know what was coming, but we had a pretty good guess the bond sector was going to respond and that they'd need funding to do that. And for me, the biggest story of the year uh, was that incredible response of local charities and community groups to the pandemic and to lockdown. I think we all knew that charities could respond quickly uh, and to, to the local needs. What maybe was a surprise was how strategically charities uh, responded, how they worked together in our towns and villages and cities to get food where it was needed within a couple of, within a week of the, um, the pandemic starting and the lockdown. Charities were coordinating so that food was distributed across the county uh, in no time and that there were befriending services set up and people have someone to talk to, um, even in those darkest days. But it was that strategic response I thought was absolutely incredible. And I think we were also all inspired by the, the immediate and compassionate response of our communities. And, and you know, the, the WhatsApp group was legendary, wasn't it? How people were just coordinating, and working together in streets and villages, uh, uh, to make sure that people who were on their own or isolated could still get the help they needed. And it's really great actually to see that some of those really informal WhatsApp groups or informal groups that started in the pandemic are now coming back to us a year later to say, well, we want to carry on working in our communities. We want to think about the next um, challenges for our communities and how we can keep that work going. So it's great to see that inspiration becoming a longer term impact for our communities. So now um, I want to just give a quick overview of what we achieved with that Sussex Crisis Fund. So, as I say, we launched that on the 20th of March and we had a fantastic response from our donors um, and from, from the public and from the National Emergencies Trust, enabled us to raise an enormous amount of money very quickly. And since between March and uh, the autumn of this year, we've actually been able to give out £4.2 million in grants for the, for the pandemic. Uh, we've supported over 546 uh, different organisations and giving 908 grants and over a million people have benefited. So and the great thing about the process done for us is because money was given in a way that was uh, unrestricted, um, we could respond really quickly. And we could also change uh, and flex our grant making to respond to the changing needs in the community. Initially, it was all about 
getting food to people really quickly, food and medicines, um, helping befriending and volunteering groups to, to deliver services through telephones and online, and then helping charities to move online. So we, we funded a lot of charities to buy laptops and um, iPads and so on. Um, but yeah, so enabling charities to change the way they are working. As the pandemic developed, um, it, it changed to help charities uh, plan back to face-to-face -face work in the autumn of 2020. And we were able to give um, added priority to key issues that arose, such as Black, Asian and minority ethnic community organisations, domestic violence, mental health, young people in education. And we're particularly pleased we were able to support the infrastructure organisations that support small charities across the county to, to, to help charities get organised. The next table will give you, give you a picture of the range of organisations that, that uh, we supported and the people that we benefited. So the biggest group, as you'd expect, is people in poverty. Uh, that obviously is very broadly defined during the pandemic because so many people were affected by the economic impact. Children and young people, local communities, Black, Asian and multi-ethnic communities, and so on. Um, of course, in many ways, it's very difficult to categorise because a lot of the groups we were funding and the grants we were giving were addressing all of those groups. But this gives you a picture of the breadth of people that have been helped. So then from April 2021, uh, we reopened the crisis fund following consultation with the community to find out what was, what was needed in that phase. And we called this the support and recovery phase. And that was aimed particularly at helping people who experienced greater health inequalities as a result of COVID and those facing acute financial difficulties. We also helped to, to fund projects reconnecting communities and bringing people back together after a long period of lockdown. So I think, and I hope we can justifiably claim to have been a significant part of the community response to the pandemic. That, I think that £4 million that's gone out has enabled a huge amount of, of volunteer activity happening across the county. So we're really proud that we've been part of that, that response and hopefully we've helped make life bearable for many, many, many people. So I want to take this opportunity particularly to thank um, our grants team and our grants committee who, who have, were incredible during the year, turning around grants within a week for most of that time, uh, changing overnight the way we um, assessed our grants from giving grants three times a year to, to weekly. Um, and especially our trustees who, who spent such an enormous amount of time making sure that money could get out really quickly. Um, but of course, the whole team shared the credit for that. We couldn't have done that if we weren't able to raise the money, if we, if we didn't have the finance systems in place to get the money paid out quickly. So thank you to all of the staff team and all of our trustees um, for the fantastic work you did last year. And ultimately, of course, none of this would have been possible without people giving us money. So I really want to give a heartfelt thank you to everyone who donated to the Sussex Crisis Fund, whatever amount it was. Uh, I particularly want to mention the National Emergencies Trust, who raised over £100 million across the UK uh, for the pandemic and distributed the majority of that through community foundations. Also, the East and West Sussex County Councils, um, American Express, the Goodwood Estate, and many of our existing fund holders and supporters. So thank you very much for your amazing support. So we know the economic fallout from the pandemic will continue for some time to come. Inequality has widened substantially, but we've also seen other issues have been brought to light, such as the challenges associated with loneliness and isolation, mental health, opportunities to children and young people, and the disparity in health and wealth outcomes experienced by many from minority communities. So while we have now closed the Sussex Crisis Fund, the impacts of the pandemic will continue to be felt for some time, and we will continue to support local charities to address these issues. So what else did we do apart from the Crisis Fund in 2021? Um, well, in September last year, we restarted our main grant programme alongside the Crisis Fund. So over the 12 months to March 2021, 
we gave out a total of 4.6 million pounds in grants. The crisis fund was about two thirds of, of that. Um, but again, you can see the, the range of other grant making that we did outside in this slide here. During the year, we've also been listening to feedback and trying to keep a close eye on what's happening in the community and what the needs are uh, today and what they're likely to be in future. Um, we've always been committed to addressing disadvantage, to promoting health and well-being, and to support vibrant local strong communities. But this year, we've also added an additional and specific commitment to address climate change through all our activity and to improve our work on equity, diversity and inclusion. The environment is the key theme of the webinar today, so I'm not going to say much more about that for now. But I want to briefly say um, a little about our commitment to equity, diversity and inclusion. And this was highlighted especially during the year through the uh, Black Lives Matter campaign and the evidence that made it very clear that, that Black and minority ethnic communities were being badly affected by the pandemic. So we were really committed to try and address some of those challenges and use that as an opportunity to examine our work and see how we can do that better. So we did some consultation last year and as you, you may remember our annual meeting last year focused on the findings of that consultation. This year we're working hard in a concerted way to make that into a reality and to look at all our areas of work and look at how we can improve. And in doing so, we're working alongside all community foundations in the UK. And in fact, the UK uh, National Conference last week was specifically focused on equity, diversity and inclusion. So do keep an eye on what we're doing, help us and, and uh, encourage us, but also expect us to include and support every aspect of the community in Sussex. There's a lot more work to do, but we're committed to continuously improving and making sure that we, as we did last year during the pandemic, we, we met the needs of the community at the urgent stage. Now we need to make sure that we're there for the long term and helping the community to make Sussex a great place to live for everyone. Thank you very much. So I'm delighted now to hand over to Stephen Chamberlain, who's going to introduce today's webinar. Thank you very much, Stephen. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. Um, in a moment, I will introduce speakers from two inspiring local charities working in this area. Um, but first, we wanted to offer some context. So the COP26 summit in Glasgow has been headline news for much of the year and is at the forefront of our minds. I think there's, there's much debate about COP26 and what exactly has been achieved and certainly frustration in many quarters at whether, whether the outcome reflects the severity of the situation. With such a supranational gathering and complex discussions about carbon budgets and limiting global temperature rises, it can be hard to feel that we have any real agency ourselves to achieve global change, even if we might feel that we're doing what we can as individuals. But in the UK, and we believe especially in Sussex, we are really fortunate to have a vibrant and engaged civil society with strong voices and a thriving voluntary sector. And that really does offer hope for the future. So we wanted to explore what this might mean for Sussex, what can be achieved locally, and how place-based groups and local philanthropy can make a difference to such huge global issues. In 2019, both East Sussex and West Sussex County Councils declared a climate emergency, with Brighton and Hove City Council having declared one the year earlier. All local councils in Sussex have pledged to become carbon neutral by 2030 or 2050. And the predicted impacts of climate change in Sussex include more frequent and intense flooding, potential for drought, episodes of extreme heat and stormier conditions. Among other things, those impacts are expected to lead to an increase in heat related deaths, particularly amongst uh, the elderly, damage to essential infrastructure, the increased cost of food, disruption to supply chains and service provision, 
sea level rises and of course an impact on our coastal habitats and wetlands. At Sussex Community Foundation we've been on quite a journey and have made quite a lot of changes in our response to climate change and to the environment more generally. Down here in Sussex, we're fortunate to have a large provider of renewable energy locally in the Rampion Offshore Wind Farm. Back in 2016, the foundation's focus was very much on addressing economic and social disadvantage. At that point, we had just two grant making funds that were interested in supporting environmental work in some way. But when we started to talk with Rampion about a potential community benefit fund, we quickly realised that the two are intimately intertwined and could be addressed in tandem. And I think today's speakers will demonstrate how. So in 2017, we launched the Rampion Fund at Sussex Community Foundation to help projects that address climate change, that promote access to the environment, that address disadvantage and that build strong communities. The fund has since made 155 grants to 129 different organisations across a vast range of projects from tiny community groups to large capital projects. I'm going to see a video about one of these shortly. Uh, I think it's fair to say that the, the partnership really was a catalyst for the foundation and has helped us to get involved significantly in whole new areas of work that bring long-term benefits to both people and planet. And since that point, we've seen more charities and more community groups setting up to address climate change and more of our donors uh, and supporters wanting to support them. We now have nine grant making funds that explicitly want to support environmental and climate change projects while benefiting local people. In addition to our local grant making, last year we signed the funders commitment on climate change that's coordinated by the Association of Charitable Foundations. And this commits us to taking action in five areas, including educating ourselves about climate change and stewarding our investments for a post-carbon future. We're still at an early stage and today's webinar indeed is part of that commitment to learn and to educate. And the, the biggest change we've made in the last two years perhaps has been to move all our invested endowment into funds that do not invest in carbon technologies. We have two investment managers. Saracen were one of the first to establish a climate active fund. And we transferred all our investments with Saracen into this at the earliest opportunity. Those funds are actively invested in companies addressing climate change. Both of our advisors, CCLA is the other, have a really good and active policy of voting and engaging with the companies they invest in to promote good environmental, social governance practice. As always though, the most interesting aspect of the work we do as a grant maker is the charities and the grassroots community groups that we're able to support with grant funding. So just a couple of examples of these. One is a capital grant made to care for veterans in Worthing and a grant of £50,000 paid for half the cost of installing solar panels to their complex of buildings. The other half was funded by another charitable trust but that investment has reduced their electricity bills by around £25,000 a year. So that truly is a gift that keeps on giving and enables them to spend more money on people whilst helping um, to keep the lights on without paying for them. Common Cause Cooperative is another one. That's a community development organisation based in Lewis, whose main focus is community food growing. They run a community allotment and orchard and uh, deliver therapeutic gardening sessions. So a grant of £5,000 helped them to run weekly therapeutic gardening sessions for people referred under a social prescribing scheme uh, and that's run with local GP practices. So that links clinical need with community assets to support people's mental and physical health and wellbeing. Those are just two examples, but in the last financial year, we were privileged to give grants of £740,000 to 88 different groups doing this type of work. So in the rest of the webinar, we'll hear from two organisations doing that inspiring work locally. But before I introduce the speakers, we just want to start by showing you a short video about the New Haven Youth Centre run by Sussex Community Development Association. They raised funds to create a new and sustainable building, and it's clearly transforming the lives of many young people. So let's have a look at the video now.
Being involved in the design process of our dedicated youth centre has been really helpful for young people and staff alike because it means that we've been able to tailor the design to what young people have asked for and what they need and want, including sort of a, a big open space that includes a kitchen area to make sure that young people are involved in all activities in one space. Cooking is such a, ma a major part of, of our service because it's a, a life skill that they learn here and it's an opportunity that they might not get elsewhere. The shape of the building was designed really to create an open space and a light space. It has natural ventilation, so you don't need air conditioning, which is obviously environmentally not, not great. Because it's a very efficient building, we've used an air source heat pump, which basically extracts heat from the air. It's extremely sustainable because it's constructed with materials that can be reused and that are grown and take up carbon dioxide as they grow. And the roofing is uh, zinc, which is completely recyclable. And we also have um, a smaller one-to-one -one space that's quite good for young people who may feel overwhelmed in group situations. I started one-to-ones here and then because I met new people within the one-to-ones, they asked me if I'd like to come along to like our LGBTQ plus and ally support team, which we have been creating in our youth forum. It's for 12 to 17 year olds in New Haven and the surrounding areas. So we're setting up activities around self-care and looking after your well-being around being LGBTQ and being an ally and how to look after yourself and other people. There's also youth counselling and we have other specialist services including New Haven Young People's Forum. SEV Youth Team help to support young people to facilitate that forum to create projects for other young people locally. Yeah, when I first came here I was really, really shy. I would never do a speech or any of the things that I've done today. And from going to all of the different things that I was doing as I was slowly coming into them more and I met new people and I definitely gained a lot of confidence. Thank you to everyone at SCDA and New Haven Youth Centre for letting us film that video. So on to today's speakers who will help us all to understand more about the impactful work those organisations are doing in their communities, what's required and where our funds are most needed. Each will speak for 10 minutes and then we'll open the floor for Q and A's at that point. Please do put your questions in the, in the chat box throughout. Don't feel you have to wait until all the speakers have finished. Whilst you don't have to have the word Sussex in your name to speak today, it's great when it does happen. So I'm really pleased to welcome our speakers today who are Carrie Court, Chief Executive at Sussex Green Living and Kelly Dibbert, Development Manager at Fair Share Sussex. So on to our first speaker, Carrie Court from Sussex Green Living. Over to you, Carrie. Thanks very much for inviting me today. The purpose of our charity is education around climate mitigation through conservation of energy and natural resources. We do this through online and in-person events, initiatives in many villages, towns, schools, social media, media, etc. Um, I'd like to give you an overview of the evolution of Sussex Green Living from our very small beginnings in 2012, our growing network show you a video and finally explain where we want to go from here. It started with me in 2012, a mum on a mission <laughs> and my really supportive family. Um, our aim or my aim was to build a network of individuals and families going on a greening journey together. Over the years, we've developed and launched many outreach initiatives, um, each time growing our network. Leap forwards to 2017, we took a big step forwards and we launched our first repair cafe or the first repair cafe in West Sussex, the Horsham Repair Cafe. Since then, we've helped to form about, uh, about 10 more. Um, and then um, over the years, lots of people from the villages have contacted us and said, we really want to help our community. How can we help them? And now we've got volunteers in 16 villages who are supporting um, their community and we're helping them to develop environmental hubs. As you can see here, these are the ones established um, and the next slide actually shows ones that are actually in the making. 
In 2019, we set up the Horsham Climate Cafe. Since then, we've helped to form another three in the surrounding area. When COVID hit in March 2020, uh, we ran the Horsham Climate Cafe using Zoom every single week. We got keynote speakers in, um, we connected, we educated and we empowered people from all over the world. This online event still continues now. Um, it's called Sussex Green Ideas and um, it's really helped to expand that network. Now, talking about networks, it's wider than Sussex Green Living. So in 2019, I co-founded the Southeast Climate Alliance, which is an alliance of faith, environmental and community groups, about 150 of them now in Kent, Surrey, Hampshire, East and West Sussex. I'm also part of the Climate Reality Leadership Corps, which is founded by Al Gore. I trained as a climate reality leader and there are about uh, 750 in the UK and 35,000 globally. So we're part of that network. 2020, we're really proud to have actually um, been awarded a CPRE Gold Award for promoting nature and countryside. Pre-COVID, we worked in about 65 schools each year, many of those schools inviting us back. They'd have us back every week if we could, if we could, could do that. Um, last year, we formed a Youth EK Forum. Um, they meet still now using Zoom every other week. Um, they applied uh, through Sussex Green Living for a Sussex Community Foundation grant to run an outdoor education day where young people ran, ran, ran workshops for young people. It was a great success. So thanks for that grant. You'll see a little of their activity in the video in a minute. We've now got about 150 volunteers and thousands of supporters. So what have we done in 2021? In September, we launched a Sussex Green Hub. It's a collaborative community initiative. It's like a climate emergency centre, um, which pops up once a month. We, our Horsham Repair Cafe is part of it, the uh, community fridge, the local transition group, and Horsham Eco Church is all part of that pop-up once a month event. On the 1st of November, we installed a display in a new shop in Horsham, the Horsham Pop-Up Shop, in collaboration with Horsham District Council. Um, we've got a display in there, and as from tomorrow, each Friday, we're going to be offering green chats, um, and the council are hopefully going to be helping to promote that. I'd now like to show you what else we have been doing in 2021 uh, with the help of many volunteers and grants, many grants, including a £5,000 grant from Sussex Community Foundation. In this short video, we're going to share the story about how our charity has transformed our environmental education in 2021 and taken it out to new audiences rather than wait for them to come to us. How we're sharing inspiring climate solutions which reduce carbon emissions and often save money. And how we're helping people make small changes which collectively make a big difference to the planet. How did we do it? will meet our Inspiration Eco Station. We worked with a team of amazing creative volunteers to transform an old 1974 milk float into something which has made people smile, laugh, talk and engage over the climate crisis and take action. We take the float with passionate environmentalists to community events and schools sometimes in partnership with other local educators and our environmental festival pops up as the bright new future roadshow. This year we've attended 20 public events and worked with 19 schools in Sussex engaging with more than 1,500 pupils aged 5 to 18. In the run-up to COP26, the United Nations Climate Change Conference, we joined forces with Rampion Wind Farms Visitors Centre and Sussex Wildlife Trust in Brighton. Children from eight primary schools joined us on the seafront at a two-day event called Inspiring Sustainable Action in Your School. 
Eco Councils from each school participated in five workshops focusing on ideas and solutions for climate action which they could implement over the next academic year, looking at renewable energy, textiles, trees, ecosystems and whole city biodiversity projects. We're planning a follow-up event at the end of the academic year to celebrate their achievements. Our unique approach to environmental education has been featured on BBC Radio Sussex, BBC South Today, twice over the last year. Our work has been highlighted in The Guardian and a number of other papers and regularly within West Sussex County Times, in which we have a weekly column. To help us to continue this really important work at events and in schools, we're seeking a sponsor or funding. If you're able to help or you'd like to book us to attend a school or public event, do get in touch. Let's work together to share the solutions and help build a sustainable, healthy, fair and just world. So we're currently writing a three year strategy and reviewing our portfolio of projects. We know we need to strengthen our operational platform. We need to make the charity resilient and sustainable, but keep it lean. To do this, we need core funding. This year, we've been awarded eight grants ranging from £250 to £5,000 plus donations. However, it takes a lot of time to apply and to report on those grants, reducing the time we spend on the coal face, excuse the pun. Um, we urgently need and want to scale up operations to share climate mitigation solutions, to empower the public and help people, pocket and planet. We have big ambitions to develop community energy in Horsham District, an open eco home trail, increase our energy conservation work, plus keep our existing portfolio of work going but we need money for projects and core funding. Thanks to uh, Sussex Community Foundation for your invaluable support um, for the grants and for inviting me to speak today. Was that 10 minutes? No, that's brilliant. Thank you very much, Carrie. I started talking with my microphone on. So yeah, that, that's wonderful. Um, just brilliant to hear how you kept your work going virtually at the height of the pandemic. And um, I think it's safe to say, we all just love the milk float idea too. Such a brilliant way to engage with people. So thank you. Thank you very much for speaking and sharing your video. Um, now we'll move on to our second speaker, who's Kelly Dibbett, Development Manager at Fairshare Sussex. So over to you, Kelly. Hello everyone, um, thanks for inviting me today. Uh, it's really nice to sort of not see you, but see you. <laughs> um, so I'm the development manager at Fairshare Sussex. I joined uh, at the beginning of 2020, just before the COVID uh, uh, lockdown. Um, so a real baptism of fire. Um, for those of you who don't know what Fairshare Sussex does, we wish to redistribute surplus food from the uh, food industry to charities and community groups across East and West Sussex um, and some into Surrey. Um, we're part of a Fair Share UK network. We've got 22 regional centres um, and we're based in Brighton. Um, so just a little bit about what I do. I manage the fundraising and communications team and our projects, employability, sustainability and expansion plans. And, you know, we do a very small bit to help the climate here at Fair Share Sussex um, with saving the surplus food. And I'm aware that we can do a lot more. Um, but I'd like to talk to you about that in a second, um, about some of our plans. But I'd like to start with a short video. Um, it was made for a European project that I oversee uh, called Flavour. And it sums up what we do nicely. And it's a little bit of fun at 4.40 on a, a Thursday afternoon to, to make you smile before I uh, give you some facts and figures. The issue of surplus. 
Food waste, or surplus, is the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases worldwide. While most food is wasted within the home and hospitality sectors, food can also be classed as surplus within the manufacturing and supply chain. Things like packaging errors, sell-by date, retailer rejections, and customer buying habits can all affect how food becomes surplus. While the ideal solution is to create less waste, there are actions that can be taken to redistribute surplus food and stop it going to landfill. Fair Share Sussex is an example of a food surplus distribution centre and a member of the Flavour Project. They receive food from a variety of different suppliers. During the summer months, they will often receive fresh produce directly from farmers. They also receive stock from supermarkets and wholesalers, as well as donations from the public. All the food they deliver is of good quality and has not exceeded its expiry date. Working with food service. So yeah, I hope you all spotted the flying banana, always made me chuckle. <laughs> um, so yeah, I thought I'd give you some facts and figures. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna put them on the screen because um, I think some of these things need to be sort of said. So Fair Share Sussex um, redistributed over 1,500 tonnes of food last year um, to 160 community groups and charities across East and West Sussex. Um, we do that with an army of 150 volunteers and those volunteers donate a whopping 60,000 hours of volunteer time a year. Um, they come into the warehouse, they sort, they pick, they pack and deliver the food in our vans. And by doing that, they, um, they, they share 10,000 meals worth of food every day. To over 21,000 people, which equates to a whopping 3.6 million meals in a year. But it only scratches the surface of food waste, what we do. Um, the Waste Resource Action uh, Programme uh, that we work with, figures state that 3.6 million tonnes of food is wasted in the food industry every year in the UK. 3.6 million tonnes doesn't get eaten um, and over 2 million tonnes is still edible and I'm just going to leave you with that just for a second just for that to sink in 2 million tonnes of food doesn't get eaten by by the the UK I find that mind-blowing but we do a great deal to help get some of that food into people's bellies and onto their plates um, and as I mentioned, you know, all these volunteers are all giving their time to, to go out into the community to deliver that food. But what else are we doing at Fair Share Sussex to help people and the planet? I'm going to list some of the things that we do. Um, the first project we, makes me very excited. Um, we've been trialling electric vehicles here at Fair Share Sussex. Um, we've had an LDV um, 80 electric refrigerated van um, to replace one of our diesel vans. And... Uh, very cool e-cargo bike. Um, it's not a milk float, uh, but uh, I am quite jealous of Carrie's milk float, but uh, one day we'll, we'll get our vehicles together and we can have a, a good chat about them. Um, uh, and the, the cargo bike is for last mile, um, uh, zero emission last mile delivery. You know, it's going into the town centre to deliver to our bulk of our projects in Brighton and Hove. Um, so, you know, it's cutting um, not only carbon emissions, but it's also like um, stopping horrible toxic fumes going into, into the air in the city, which makes a big difference. You know, we need, we need more of that. Um, so, you know, uh, think before you drive into town. Um, not only are the, uh, the vehicles really good fun, the volunteers love driving the electric van because it's quiet and it's easy to drive, it's automatic. Um, and obviously they, you know, they like driving around in a van that says this is this vehicle is electric. They got lots of toots and things, um, but they also have saved us money. The electric vehicles save us around two and a half thousand pounds a year in fuel. 
Um, they've saved over 5,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide from going into the atmosphere. As I mentioned, they're also cutting our toxic air pollution in the city, which we've got some real hotspots for. Um, we've recruited a team of 15 wonderful bike riders who go out on the cargo bike. Um, most of the volunteers are keen cyclists. Uh, and they get they really get that we need to cut our um, em emissions and we need to do it sort of now. <laughs> um, they deliver to on the on the bike, they deliver to about 20 projects a week. Um, and our aim is to turn our entire fleet electric. Unfortunately, there is a sticking point with doing that. The electric vehicles are considerably more expensive than a diesel van. So to give you uh, a bit of a shock, the, D, the electric van costs £91,000 and a diesel van costs about 36 37 So there's a big difference in the price and we're really hoping that that can change soon. But obviously to turn the entire fleet um, electric is, is impossible for us at the moment, but we, we hope to do that in the, in the near future. And just a little anecdote of um, a really nice people story. Uh, we really like to kind of develop people here at Fairshare. Um, as you can see behind me, ooh, I'll move out of the way. That's a big group of our volunteers just before lockdown. Um, we had a, a leaving uh, due for one of our volunteers um, who had uh, come to us uh, as a volunteer and then became a member of staff. And yesterday I walked past one of our warehouse assistants and he was training someone on the uh, cargo bike how to use it we've got a full system and a, a you know um a good training program to, before they go out on the bikes by themselves and it was just wonderful to hear him and this particular warehouse volunteer uh, member of staff came to us on probation um he then uh, continued to volunteer for us and then we hired him in march 2020 and he's been an absolute legend a real kind of key member of the team and it's just lovely to see people develop and, and, you know, that, that bike is part of our daily operation now, so it's really lovely to see. Um, a few other things that we're doing. Um, we're part of Low Carbon Leaders, which is a new initiative um, for small and medium enterprises to learn and share best practice and influence other small businesses to across the globe. In fact, it's a global movement to help them become uh, more than carbon net zero to make them sub-zero, which I, I find actually a brilliant idea. Um, we are trialing uh, route mapping software so that our vans are more efficient and so there will therefore we'll be saving fuel and therefore emissions, um, which is which is great. Um, a simple piece of technology that does cost a bit of money, but can make a big difference to how much fuel we're burning um, until we get fully electric. We are supporting some lovely local food growing projects, um, Nurture to Nature and Grubhub. So, you know, looking at kind of the food system as a whole, it's, it's insane that that 3.6 million tons of food doesn't get used in the UK that's produced. Um, and so, you know, starting to think about locally grown food and they, they give us, us their surplus to, to share with our community food members, which is great. We use Nest for our pensions because they don't invest in anything, um, you know, in fossil fuels, which is really important to, to us. It's part of our strategic aims to have a good, strong social and environmental impact. And we don't use any of the high street banks, HSBC, Barclays, NatWest, all are huge funders of the fossil fuel industry. So we choose to bank with Triodos and the co-op um, because these small changes that you can make as a, an individual, as a business, um, it, just in your banking that you can do overnight, make a massive in, impact on um, cutting emissions, essentially, and a strong message that it's not appropriate to be funding fossil fuels anymore. And last but not least, I'm very excited to say, and I'm extremely proud, is that we've had our carbon footprint uh, analysed as a business, um, as a charity. Um, as I said, you know, we've got diesel vans, you know, we've got the lights on, we've got the heating on at the moment, we do all sorts of things. Those 150 volunteers come to us in all sorts of ways. We try and encourage them to, to come on the bus, to cycle. Most of our staff team cycle to work, um, which, is, which is amazing. But this uh, carbon footprint analysis is, is really important because it's made us uh, create an action plan. And we're putting together a green team and the green team it's going to include uh, members of staff from across the business. Um, and we had an amazing workshop by the consultant, Anya Ledwith, um, who did our, our carbon footprint analysis with us. 
um, where we got the whole team involved, where we all kind of looked at all the different areas of our business and how we could implement changes. So like everyone had ideas. And when the green team is fully formed, um, hopefully by the end of the year, which will be volunteers, staff, hopefully some trustees and potentially some of our community food members as well, who we deliver food to, um, so that they can, they can sort of be part of that journey with us. We're going to sort of implement the action plan to cut our emissions um, substantially uh, next year, looking at 30% um, uh, emissions, um, reducing our emissions by 30%, which is great. And some examples of what we might do is we want to use the electric vehicles more. Um, we want more people coming to the site um, using sustainable transport, car sharing, getting the bus. We're, we're right next to really good routes for public transport. Um, and then we're going to do some driver training uh, on fuel, which will impact our fuel efficiency. Um, you know, our volunteers come in and, and drive the vans uh, once a week and they, you know, they all drive in different ways and it can, it can massively reduce your fuel bill uh, by the way that you drive. So that's it, really. I mean, we'll be sharing our achievements uh, as we go along on this journey of reducing our carbon footprint um, as we go along. Um, and we hope uh, to influence our charity partners, individuals and, and our suppliers to, to be greener through this process and the other regional centres who are all really keen to do the same thing. It's just about getting that funding at the moment to have your carbon footprint analysed. Um, and it not being a priority, which it kind of, it really must be a priority, um, is, is what we believe. And one last thing before I go, um, thanks for listening to me waffle on, um, is that if there's any budding cyclists who are watching today, uh, we are recruiting some more uh, uh, people for the cargo bike. It's, it goes up hills like you wouldn't believe, and uh, it takes up to 250 kilos of food to our bike projects. And we'd love to have them in all the towns and cities that we work in. Um, but, you know, watch this space. So thanks, everyone. Brilliant. Um, just brilliant. Thank you, Kelly. Um, I just think some of the way well, it's, it's, it's great to have that overview um, of the work of World Fair Share in Sussex and sort of hear about how, how connected you are locally. But some of those those numbers are just just astounding. Um, I think you said you you deliver food to 160 community groups, over 150 volunteers, and and that volunteer story is obviously a really great one as well. In in, in addition to all your work with climate change, um, you're affecting people's lives and 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 helping them to to progress too. And it's clear that you know there's hundreds of people gaining from that as well. So thank you very much. Um, I'm now going to welcome back Carrie and Kevin again to join us for uh, the Q&A. Um, we've, we've seen some questions coming through already. Please do continue to keep those coming in the chat box. We'll get to as many of those as we can um, in the time and um, others we can kind of pick up and connect people and answer those outside of the session um, if there's not time. So um, now we've got everyone back. I'm going to kick off with the first question, which is to um, Kelly. How do you recruit your volunteers um, and how long might they typically stay uh, volunteering with Fair Share Sussex? So we have a process where they apply online um, and then they come for a, a induction with our volunteer coordinator, Josie. Um, we expect them to commit to a four hour, a minimum of a four hour shift every week, regular shift so that we can plan um, and we like them to stay for at least three months. So um, some of our volunteers have been with us for over a decade because <laughs> they love it so much. We, we give them a vegan surplus surplus hot lunch every day. Um, and, uh, you know, once once they come, it's, it's hard to leave. But people leave for all sorts of reasons to go into jobs and things. But uh, if you'd like to volunteer, I can I can put a link in the chat. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I wonder if you might get some um, takers for the carbon bike volunteering thing just from this <laughs> session. Sounds, <laughs> sounds great. Um, thank you, Kelly. Um, moving on to um, the next question. This is from Mabrak. Um, I mean, any, anyone could take this, but perhaps we'll start with Carrie first and um, then if um, Kelly, you want, want to jump in. And it's how can we help children to connect with those global children who are very much already affected by climate change, um, so to reduce overconsumption of, of resources. 
Um, and and Brack adds that the connection with food growers across the planet is very important. Um, Carrie, because of your work in, in schools, have, have you got some insight about that question? Yeah, it's a complicated one, but um, I mean, my pet subject is um, clothes and climate change. And so we do a lot of work in schools looking at what kind of clothes um, and how we can reduce our impact. Um, and as part of that, we look at um, social responsibility and the environmental impacts of the fast fashion industry um, on people who are, yeah, most of our clothes come from uh, Asia and um, 80% of our clothes come from, from China um, and many other countries in Asia. And um, yeah, many of those people, the poorest people in those countries are the worst affected. So it, it, it's been, we've really adapted our education um, post COVID, if we can say it's post COVID <laughs> this year. Um, uh, so yeah, it's a matter of really trying to very much twist things to share, you know, the impacts on the worst affected, but uh, without giving too much doom and gloom. We focus a lot with the children on the, the majority, the solutions of which there are many. And, and they're much wiser probably than their parents about the solutions actually. So, uh, yeah. Brilliant, thank you. And um, Kelly, you, you don't work with children in, in such the same direct way, but I mean, is, is, is the provenance of the food that you're rescuing from landfill and having a you know an understanding of that backstory of that food is important to fair share uh yeah absolutely um you know and and children really do it we, we support a lot of children and families through the projects that we work through um and you know i i was at, i i was at the low carbon leaders event yesterday where a 12 year old girl was the the last speaker at the event out of about and that said it all really because that's that's why we're we would you know <laughs> we, we've really got to make a difference very 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 quickly because you know that that young girl got up and and um is it, she's scared she's scared of the world that she's going to inherit and she's she was pretty much begging us to make sure that we we really get uh the carbon emissions down as soon as possible so you know it's inspiring to see young people stand up and have the bravery to do that especially a 12 year old i don't think i would have been able to do that but um yeah we've really got to we've got to step up about quite well quite a few gears haven't we really that's why we love working with children really is they really get it they really understand the problem um and um yeah, we give them tools, we give them surveys, we give them games they can take back home and guides they can take back home and engage with their parents over to help to take that message back to those that are really busy and maybe very worried about their children's futures but don't know what to do. So we send tools back with the children to help them speak to their parents. Well, that, that's a nice link, I think, to the, to the next question. If we, if we think of kind of children influencing their parents, then... Um, we, we had a question from Miranda, and actually, I, th I think it'd be good to get a, a, a brief thought from all three of you on this. Um, and this is, this is, you know, what's your view, or how, how do your organisations work with local policy ma makers, local government, and you know, even national government to influence policy change, in addition to supporting the, the work that you, you do as well? Um, Carrie, do you want to just start off? Yes, I mean, we work, we work very closely with West Sussex County Council. We're based actually, most of our environmental activities are in West Sussex, um, a lot in Horsham District. And so we work with West Sussex County Council, um, Horsham District Council, and many of the other councils, um, as well as campaigning the MPs. <laughs> um, and um, we're really trying to nicely apply the pressure um, and try and help them and support them and through the Southeast Climate Alliance that I mentioned I was the co-founder of and I sit on the steering committee of um, that's all about really working with the councils to um, either crack the whip <laughs> or um, dangle the carrot whichever approach is felt to be most appropriate in that area. Did I answer your question? You, yes, you did. Yeah, thank you. And I believe we might have some representatives from um, the local authorities um, in, in the event today. Um, 
Kelly, did you want to add anything? Uh, not really to that question, not at this stage. Um, and, and, and Kevin, because do you, yes. do you think there's a role for the Community Foundation there as well? Well, I, th I think what I'd want to emphasise is actually the role of um, groups like Sussex Green Living and, and, uh, and Fair Share. And I think listening to the talk you've both given, by everything you're doing, you're, you're demonstrating how being aware of your impacts on the environment actually is better, it's cheaper, it's more effective, it's more efficient, it's better for us locally, it's better for us globally. And, and I think that there was a really strong, I wish I can remember the quote, but I think it was the UN uh, Secretary General was saying about uh, after the COP26 saying, well, you know, in a way it was a bit disappointing, but actually it will change because of the pressure at the grassroots, because small organisations, communities are saying, look, this is how you can do it. And we've got to do this now. And, and the pressure is growing ever more. And actually, it's not just from, from the voluntary sector and the community. You know, businesses are doing the same thing. The, the pressure is coming from business as well. Um, but the, that, that grassroots pressure will lead to change. And I think it's, it's as you're saying, Carrie, it, it is a bit of carrot and stick. There's, it needs the campaigning and it needs the, the pressure, but it also needs that great example that, that the volunteer and community sector can do is to say, well, let's just go and prove this works. <laughs> I think the, the thing is, you know, they say they've done surveys over COP26 and about 80% of the UK population are really worried, really worried about climate change. And actually a huge percentage of those people actually don't know what to do about it. So when you empower them, when you educate them and you give them tools that they can go away and make lifestyle changes and they can volunteer, like Kelly's saying, and come and join you and join your army. I call it the green army. Um, mm. That really motivates and that really inspires people and helps people out of this climate um, depression and climate anxiety. So, you know, now is the time really, um, post COP. Um, yeah, it's never been more heightened, the awareness and people want to do things. So we have to share the solutions. Um, that, that's, that's really interesting. And, and in fact, we've had an, another question in on, on that subject. So we, we've got a, a large number of our um, audience today are from other voluntary sector organisations. So if you're in some position of influence within an org, a, a local grassroots community group or a charity, um, how can other charities, perhaps not having climate change as their main focus, what might they do locally to support this message? There's a climate literacy programme that I'm very keen to get my volunteers um, attending. Um, I'll share the link in a minute. Um, it's a relatively new training programme. Um, they can attend online. Um, I know West Sussex County Council have trained some of their councillors, and I hope many of their officers at this moment in time. Um, and we're hoping to encourage Horsham District Council to do the same. So that's something that anyone can do, and it's terribly accessible because it's via Zoom, um, and actually do a sort of a uh, an analysis of well like Kelly was saying look at their carbon footprint um, there's more and more carbon footprinting tools out there um, that they can use there's a WWF carbon footprint app that as an individual they could encourage their staff to use which is really good so yeah get people in to talk um, yeah lots mm. brilliant thank thing. you oh. go for it Kelly one of the things I'd, I'd like to add is that um, I think everybody, my dad said to me um, a while ago uh, that everybody has heard about climate change now. You know, it's it's been knocking around for about 30 years. I studied it 28 years ago, but pretty much everyone's heard of it now. But there's a massive disconnect with actual action and, you know, declaring climate emergencies is all well and good. But things like when councils declare climate emergencies and then they rip out bike lanes it's it's it doesn't it doesn't fit it, it isn't true you can't declare a climate emergency and then not act on behalf of that 12 year old girl who I saw talking yesterday who wanted to cycle on that bike lane you know that sustainable transport is a simple solution so there needs to be a kind of a real kind of commitment from from people to actually really act rather than just talk because 
otherwise nothing's going to change so you know I, I, I really wanted to say that so yeah. <laughs> thanks for letting me say that and I'm, 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 ple I'm pleased you did thank you Kelly um, we can also um, share to any any guests here some of the resources that we've been talking about too um, we'll drop those around in an email um, a quick question um, for Kevin uh, during the crisis fund you changed from um mainly making grants around three times a year to um a weekly uh to weekly grants making has this influenced how you approach grant making for the future so that's a really good question and i think yes it has i think i think um we learned a tremendous amount there and i, and I think the, the you know, not least that actually we saw how responsive the voluntary sector could be if funding could be as responsive as they are. <laughs> yeah, as I said, the kind of things people wanted money for changed dramatically from March to May to June and so on. And the crisis fund, because we were giving grants weekly, was able to do that. And that, that was actually really exciting uh, to be able to do. Um, but we could only do that because actually we were given a lot of money and people were very, very generous and but said, it's over to you, uh, decide how you make that, how you make the grants. Our normal grant making is has a lot more involvement of donors, which is a real positive because it gets people really excited and engaged, and hopefully that means they give more money. Um, but I think what we need to try and do is try and do a bit of both. Um, if we can find a way that we can be engaging uh, and and to showing our donors the impact we're having while also being more responsive, that would be fantastic. But we did learn a lot how that we could actually do good grant making very quickly and our due, to, due diligence I think was still strong and robust. So that's one thing we're looking at as a team now is what can we learn from that time going ahead? What can we do differently? How can we uh, find other ways to get donors excited and demonstrate the impact we can have? So, so it's an exciting time for us because we think we can do a lot more in the future and we can re really rethink based on that experience. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to keep going with the questions as well as they're coming in. This um, one is uh, to Kelly. Um, how do you either connect with or, or decide which of your over 100 organisations are, are going, you're going to distribute the food to? What's, what's your process? And, and can you tell us a bit about the types of organisations they are? Sure. Yeah, the types of organisations. So we've got um, uh, most recently the biggest growth area is in food clubs, which is a move away from food banks. Um, and it picks up people who are in food poverty and working um, and that wouldn't get referrals. Uh, so that there's a massive growth in that. Um, we've got we deliver to some food banks, uh, some schools, some homeless hostels, uh, community centres. Um, projects that support people with um, HIV, um, projects that support people um, who've experienced domestic violence, um, you, you name it basically, um, projects that support uh, young families on low incomes. Um, and you know, that, that kind of, some work that I'm doing at the moment, I'm looking at areas of deprivation and you know, there's a huge amount of people who are in food poverty that are too proud to ask for help. And COVID really brought that home is that people really kind of, you know, would come out, but they, they work so hard, they work really long hours and they still can't afford their rent and they still can't afford to live. And they, they a food club kind of bridges that gap. Um, uh, so yeah, that's the, that's the kind of project. And how do we, how do we um, distribute the food? Well, we have different categories of weights of food. So that depends on, um, on uh, how many people the project is feeding um, and there is a small service charge for the food although we've reduced that by 66 percent this financial year because of covid um, and uh, so you know we distribute on depending on how much the the projects want and each day the food comes in the surplus and it changes day to day um, week to week and it's a fair share of the food is allocated by members of staff and then it gets picked put on the vans and delivered out some projects in Brighton come and pick up from us as well. And in fact, some projects in Surrey come and pick up from us because they're desperate for food, um, which is remarkable, but uh, that, that's the state of affairs. Wow. Thank, thank you, thank you, Kelly. And 
LinkedIn with that. We, we've heard you, you've got a computer system called Gladys, which has intrigued us. Can you tell us a bit about Gladys, please? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I wasn't expecting that question. Gladys gets cursed quite a lot. So. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. And we'll move swiftly on then. It's <laughs> Oh, Gladys. Um, no, it is it's a useful system. It's just a bit old and clunky now, but you know that all the food gets inputted onto that system as it comes in. It's a very manual, laborious process um, from the different kind of uh, logistics companies, from the distribution centers to the big supermarkets. It comes in in the morning, it's put onto that system manually. You can't just scan it like they do in other countries, which I've learned from the Flavor Project, which I mentioned earlier that they do. Um, and then uh, someone literally manually sits there and allocates the orders to the different projects every day, and then it gets picked by the volunteers. Um, so yeah, it's it's um it's uh, an interesting system. Does, does that stand for something? Was <laughs> it just a nickname? Sorry, uh, it does it does stand for something, but I can't remember. So okay. we're putting on the spot now. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Um, this one um, is, is quite a big question, but let, let's give it a go. Um, perhaps Carrie first. Um, can Carrie and Kelly advise on what would make a real practical sustainability policy? Um, and again, this is echoing the, the thoughts that you, you both said that sustainable action should be a core approach for all of us, whatever we're doing. Sorry, sorry, I, I don't understand what the actual question of me is. Um, can, can you advise what would make a real practical sustainability policy? I guess this is in addition, what might be some of the first steps you've mentioned, one with that link that you shared. What, what, what Are there some easy next practical steps that an organisation might take towards? I'm sure, I know Kelly's been through with their share, um, measuring their carbon footprint. I mean, so she's probably better qualified than I am for, from a business perspective. I mean, one thing that I would really encourage all businesses as well as individuals to look at is their energy provider, um, you know, as a sort of first port of call and how they're investing their pensions and um, and the banks that they're actually using as an indiv as individuals, as well as the business. Um, so, yeah, over to you, Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Carrie. <laughs> Welcome. Um, well, it's, it's funny, actually, because Anya Ledworth, who did our carbon footprint, is watching at the moment. So I just sent her a little message to say good job. I was nice about her. <laughs> Um, but uh, yeah, so I mean, uh, what else could people do? I mean, the, the, the green energy is, is a really important thing. Um, encouraging uh, sustainable transport, um, more working from home potentially, uh, lowering your thermostat, um, eating less meat. It's really obvious. Uh, you know, um, you don't have to be 100% vegan, but, you know, vegan food is absolutely delicious. We have it here every day at lunch and it, it's, it's not it's not what, you know, old school people think is, is terrible food. It's delicious. So cutting your cutting your meat out, quite a simple thing to do. Um, and, you know, huge, huge difference in, in carbon footprint on, on meat compared to vegetables and um, pulses and things. Um, and dairy obviously is, is horrific you know they're cutting down the amazon to to basically feed us beef it's disgraceful you know so we all just cut down that would be make a massive difference um uh yeah i i i can't think of anything else i think I, I sort of thought you were talking specifically about businesses i mean another thing that people um businesses could look into uh, certainly in west sussex is west sussex county council are doing some trials on um hydrogen um uh, helping businesses to trial hydrogen vehicles so to take right. one of their vehicles actually um and and buy purchase one hydrogen vehicle then provide a communal facility on a big industrial estate and then measure the outcomes to try and help to transition i don't know much more about it than that but from but i know in crawley the manor royal um, there's a trial and somewhere else further south in West Sussex. Mm. Yeah, really I mean, it's, it's sort of like is electric, the Betamax, isn't it? You know, hydrogen is the next big thing, but, um, you know, we're, we're, it's not there yet. So we're, we're not going to get hydrogen vehicles as well as electric just yet. <laughs> but yeah, I no, think, I think 
Yeah, there are some HBO um, trials going on as well. So, you know, yeah, it's looking at alternatives, isn't it? What's commercially viable, um, but balancing commercial viability with, you know, the impact on the planet and the cost of climate change if we don't change. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, thank just you. So, just so yeah, go for it, Kevin. You mentioned, Stephen, in your introduction that the Sussex, Sussex Community Foundation has signed up to the funders' commitment on climate change. Uh, which is, uh, it started by a small group of charitable trusts and has now become part of the Association of Charitable Foundations. Um, so, we're, yeah, we've signed up to that. And I, I have to say, you know, we're still at the early stages of that. But, but as part of that commitment, we're looking at everything we do as a funder um, and as, as an organisation and what our impact is on climate and trying to um, reduce climate change in everything we've, we do. We've, we've mentioned already that we, as part of that, we've moved our investments out of carbon and to um, investment managers that are proactively investing to address climate change. Uh, we've we've got more grant programs now than, than we've ever had before, and the Vampion Fund has given a massive boost to that, of course, because it's a substantial fund. Um, but also with you know through through having those environmental funds, we're actually we're able to attract more because. The, the more grant making we do in that area, the more people see what a benefit it is. Um, and certainly we're seeing a lot of our donors are more interested in funding projects that are addressing climate change. Maybe not least because their children are saying to them, you know, mum and dad, what are you doing about, <laughs> about this? You know, the 12 year olds and the 25 year olds and, uh, you know, putting pressure on their parents, which is great. Um, but yeah, we also need to look at all of our carbon footprint, and that's probably something we need to do, do more about uh, as an organisation. Um, you know, maybe we need to get Anya in to help us as well. Um, but um, yeah, and it's also having these discussions, isn't it? Having these forums and, and using our, our ability to bring people together to discuss and spread the word and get people thinking more. So all of that, I think, is important. And that's what that's what we're doing. Actually, can I add one more? Yeah. Just thinking about it, businesses, big rooftops, um, care homes, um, schools. Um, another thing they could really do that would greatly help the community, the people, planet, etc., is to um, look at community energy through community energy groups. So if they've got a big roof space, um, they don't have to invest in that um, solar, for example, but actually working with a community energy group. They could get solar on their roof if they've got a big rooftop and they're a big energy user, then they'll get much cheaper energy. They'll make a huge saving, as your video showed. Mm -hmm. um, and they any profits um, then go back to the community to use for environment for the benefit of people and planet. It, it's, what, what's, what's the main organisation locally that um, someone could contact to find out more about that? Well, Sussex Community Found, um, Sussex Community Foundation, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> um, Community Energy South community energy are, are the South, umbrella yeah. organisation for community energy. So that's yeah, who I, I don't, Kelly might say someone different, but. It sounds, it sounds really interesting. Start, definitely, yeah. And we can we've got time for there. one. We've got time for one one more question um, before we wrap up, and and this one I thought was quite quite interesting actually, um, and it's one one for you, Kenny, from Paul, um, and it's it's about where you get the foods you 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 distribute, and uh, I, I believe some of those are quite big organisations. So how cooperative are the food donors, and is there more that they could do? Yeah, I've actually put an answer to that question in the chat. Oh, sorry, I haven't seen that. No, it's fine. It's fine. Um, essentially, yes, we do. Uh, so Fair Share UK, who's our sort of uh, overseeing umbrella organisation, has the relationships with the big supermarkets, the manufacturers, the distributors. But there, yeah, there is a lot more that they could do um, because the food system that they have created, that they push for, of overproduction, of flying in fruit and vegetables from Peru and all over the world and, and you know flying in lamb if you do eat meat from all over the world rather than eating what we've got and you know god my friend directed a tv show called um what britain buys and sells in a day and it was absolutely foul they you know we we create all, we've got these huge salmon farms in scotland all of that food gets shipped all around the world and then we ship in exactly the same volume of salmon from other places in the world <laughs> How insane is that? And that is the supermarket's fault for pushing for cheaper food. And so the food system is, is wrong. And, you know, I'm glad that Fair Share exists. 
um, to kind of stop, bridge that gap. But there is a lot more food that could come to us and they need to start really looking at their, their purchasing um, and, and what they actually do um, because that, that hit, they have a huge impact on the climate, these big organisations. So, yeah, as much as I, you know, thank them for getting the food so we can feed people, it's, it's not right and, and there needs to be a big shift, a big shift in, in, in what they encourage producers to do. Um, it's cheaper for farmers in the UK and we've had a campaign called Food on Plates um, and we've been lobbying government to say, you know, we, we need to pay farmers to get food that they would normally leave to rot in the fields onto people's plates, but it's cheaper for them to just leave it rotting in the fields, which is, is atrocious, it's abhorrent and, and a really messed up system so you know there's other things that businesses can do and individuals you can lobby your local government you can get together and and say you know this these systems aren't okay we need to change them you know if the more they hear that hopefully the more change they'll an action they'll actually take thank you thank you kelly um Kelly, were you jumping in I was just going to say, when I'm speaking to children, when I'm speaking to adults, um, following on from Kelly, I always say, before you buy anything, think, one, do you need it? If you do need it, think, where has it come from? Could I buy it closer to home? Could I make it? <laughs> um, what's it made of and what environmental impact will that have? And, and, and most importantly, where will it go if, if, if you don't need it after a given period of time? And that makes people just realise where their food has come from, where their clothes have come from, where their plastic tutors come from. <laughs> um, and with Christmas coming up, that would be my big appeal. Mm. Think, where's it come from? Yeah. Brilliant. And yeah, that, absolutely. Thank, thank you. I mean, mm. so, so, I think we've covered so much ground today, you know, lots for us all to think about, um, both as individuals to explore more and, and for the organisations um, that we, we, we work with. But I mean, amongst the really complicated situation you painted you know, a story of positivity and where you know we can affect change or we, we might need to kind of step up to the plate to do that we've got eight minutes left so um i'm just gonna hand over to kevin um for the conclusion thank you everyone thank you very much for how to how to finish that off i mean i just think I've, i want to say really i suppose I hope that that uh, discussion has shown really what a fantastic resource we have in the community in Sussex. Um, and I, I going back to my earlier comment, you know, climate change is one of the greatest problems we face as a society. It's one of many, but I think for all of these areas, let's look for the local solutions. I think Kelly and Carrie have shown us there's two people and two organisations who know what the issues are, they know what the solutions are, and they're showing how we can make a difference locally. So the lessons are there. Uh, I think our, our job as the Community Foundation is to make sure we continue to support and, and those organisations so they can thrive and they can continue finding the solutions to the problems we face. Um, I think one last thing I'll say actually, to add into Carrie's uh, last comment, when, when you, whenever you buy something, whenever you do something, think about where it's come from let's also think about the people who've been there along the way because that was answered i think rack's point at the beginning that's where the connection is if we're buying our clothes that have been made in in china or pakistan or bangladesh or then actually we think about the people who've made it the people who brought it to us people who sold it to us actually that connects us all as a planet um, and that's something we can all be doing um, as i say the, the sussex community foundation is really delighted to be supporting groups like Fair Share and like Sussex Green Living. We can only do that because local people are supporting us. So we look forward really to uh, people continue to support us so that we can continue to make a difference and support these fantastic local organisations. Um, I'm actually going to hand over to Keith to finish off the session. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Kevin. Thank you, everybody. It's easy to despair, but we really, we mustn't despair. Um, the poor and the disadvantaged are uh, those who are most at uh, risk and will suffer the most from global warming, uh, both in this country and as Mabrak has been reminding us in the chat uh, overseas. 
in other countries where there's much more poverty than we see here. But when we hear individuals uh, like Carrie and Kelly, and we see and about their teams, and we hear also from the individuals at uh, the New Haven Youth Centre, we realise there's so much uh, to be optimistic about because there are a thousand and one things that each of us can do and each of our organisations can do. Uh, and together, this can have an enormous cumulative effect uh, uh, on uh, the situation that we face at the moment. Thank you to all. Thank you especially to Carrie and Kelly and to the New Haven Youth Centre members who've contributed. Uh, thank you to everybody at the Sussex Community Foundation who've done, as, as you always, such an excellent job in pulling all this together. Uh, you've given us all a lot to think about. Uh, good night.